Thank you, Zoom. Okay, let's start with uh, <clears throat> Steve. Steve, um, Steve. So uh, I, I don't know if it's just my impression. I don't know if it's just the modern media, but it feels like we are living the age of revolutions. Uh, we have had the revolutions when the Soviet Union collapsed. We had the color revolutions. The Arab Spring, I lost count, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, and so on and so on. Um, Myanmar, Venezuela, Sudan, Belarus right now, Lebanon right now, Mali, sounds like Mali succeeded. Um, so the list goes on and on. And all of this in what, 20, 30 years. So what's your uh, feeling, opinion, yeah, are there patterns in the revolutions of the past and the present? Um, what defines a success? Um, um, how do we measure success? Uh, what do revolutions leave behind? Can you give us sort of a five minute summary of the history of revolutions? <laughs> yes, right after Saul gives us a five minute summary of physics. Um, so, um, you know, historians love to argue uh, and we love to argue about definitions. Um, but I think for tonight's purposes, let's say that uh, a revolution is a, a dramatic, often violent, uh, quick uh, event that brings broad social and political change. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish a revolution from a revolt or a coup or a civil war. And what about wars of independence? Are those revolutions? some of them perhaps. Um, I think from a modern history perspective, um, uh, the keys are having a mass movement uh, and having some ideology. Uh, and so we can look back in history and say there have been a lot of revolutions for the last, depending on how you want to count it, uh, 300 and some years. Uh, the Glorious Revolution in England in, eight, in 1689, uh, the American so-called revolution, I don't really count that except it's so embedded in our language, um, not necessarily a big change in, uh, in power structures. Uh, one might say it was a bunch of one group of rich white guys replacing another group of rich white guys. Um, Probably the most famous and, uh, and sort of the role model is the French Revolution, the Great Revolution of 1789. Um, but you can look down through the 19th century in China and the Taipei Rebellion, the Indian War of Independence, uh, what some people call the War of Northern Aggression or the War of Southern Secession uh, in the United States. Uh, so there have been a lot of changes in the 19th century uh, in the 20th century, we have a Russian Revolution in 1905. That didn't really work. You had Chinese and American Revo and Mexican revolutions in 1912. Uh, the other one that meets most of the requirements is uh, the Russian Revolution of uh, 1917. Uh, that worked at least for about 70 years. Um, can you say that Mussolini and Hitler launched a revolution of fascism from the right? Revolution doesn't have to be about moving to the left. Um, and then the post-war, post-World War II decolonization. Some were violent, some were not. Most of them instituted pretty profound changes. Um, what about Deng Xiaoping in, in China in the late 70s? The formal structure didn't change, but the country certainly did. Um, and then, the, as you say, the, the color revolutions uh, associated with the collapse of the Soviet empire at the end of the 1980s and into the 1990s, uh, into the Arab Spring. So we've got a lot we can talk about uh, from a historical perspective. Uh, I would just say to answer your question about what is success, it depends on when you ask. If you'd ask about the Russian Revolution of 1905, if you'd asked in 1906, people would have said, ah, a lot of changes. If you'd asked in 1907, you would have said, didn't work. Uh, if you ask about the Russian Revolution of 1917, like I said, great for 70 years and then not so much. 
Um, and even the French Revolution, people argued that, well, it didn't really take effect for about 90 years before they finally got rid of all the kings and emperors and so on. It was, uh, it was 1870. So is it quick and dramatic? And that's just the political stuff. I won't even get into the agrarian revolution or the industrial revolution or information revolution and all the other socioeconomic ones. We can leave that for later in the discussion. So it's, it's, uh, we are a little biased when we call something revolution. Uh, let, me, let me ask you a simple question. Why we never called ISIS, Islamic State Revolution? I mean, after all, it was a grassroots movement. They were pretty amazing that they recruited people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they built a state. Uh, for a while, it was pretty big. But we right. don't call it a revolution, right? No, we don't. Um, it's not clear that it you know, ever achieved any stability. Um, of course, you can say the same thing about the French Revolution in 1789. There's certainly no model of stability. It changed every couple of years. Um, so you, you're right to say that there's a, a lot of ideology around the labeling. Um, as I said, some things are, war, are civil wars, some things are coups, some things are revolts, some things are wars of independence, uh, some things are revolution. It depends on what the political agenda is of the, uh, of the historian or, uh, or other commentator. So why, why so many in the last 20, 30 years? It sounds almost like a contradiction because states are becoming more powerful. I mean, militarily speaking, I mean, you have, I mean, states have, uh, have uh, just, you know, in terms of guns, of, of, of uh, police, uh, seems to be much stronger in the past. And uh, a lot of these states that had these revolutions, they also control the media. So why we have so many? It should be going the other way around. <clears throat> um, well, uh, you know, the analysis of, uh, of why you know, incumbents, you know, how, when and how they use their power, um, you know, is, shall we say, highly contingent. Um, and um, there is something to a sense of democratization and public opinion and not wanting to look bad um, that constrains people in power in some cases, obviously not in all. You can look at what's going on in Belarus this week, right? Um, we'll, see how that, we'll see how that one turns out. But I would also say, if you look broadly, that yes, states have a lot more power, howitzers and atomic bombs, but military power is actually much more democratic now than it was 300 years ago. It's not so difficult to get an Uzi, right? And lots of, there were a hundred million of them around the world, perhaps more. Um, so amassing the firepower to launch a military uprising, not nearly as difficult as it might have been in the 18th century. Hmm. Same question. Why so many in the last 20 years? What's your opinion? Is it, is well, it just, I think uh, there's a we live lot. in an age where we want novelty? We live in an age where, you know, people want to move fast? What's... Uh... Well, I, I would say there, there, there's two things. One, the, the color revolutions, you know, are of a piece in a sense that they come upon the collapse of the Soviet empire. Right? So that's, that's a big chunk. Um, the second is uh, in the absence of the Cold War, uh, and uh, the limit, the significant limitations on American power, uh, and the absence of anybody else to do it. Um, a lot of these uprisings taking place in geographic areas where nobody's going to come in with enough firepower to stop it. So there's a, a not a vacuum, but a, a reduction in incumbent overwhelming power. You know, mm -hmm. if you take the quote, lessons from Vietnam and our lessons from Vietnam and the Russians' lessons from Afghanistan, and now our lessons from Afghanistan, um, you know, not so easy to project power and control things. So there's space for people uh, to rise up 
And I would say the, the, the last factor is with modern media, and I don't just mean, you know, Facebook and, and Twitter, um, people are aware of the, of the world in new ways. And there is something to the idea of a revolution of rising expectations. People are aware of possibilities and that is feasible. And that encourages them to try to promote change in their country. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Now, very important for me, what's the connection between <clears throat> ideology and practical daily issues? Many of these revolutions started because of economic uh, uh, issues or against corruption. These are issues that don't have an ideology. I mean, if you don't have a job, you don't have a job. That's regardless of whether you're a communist, a fascist, uh, whatever. Um, but then there's ideology. So what's, what's the connection between the two? How do the two uh, play together? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, and I, I don't want to play semantics, but I don't consider it to be a revolution unless ideology is involved. Unless there's an attempt to try to change the principles and structure of society. Like I said, there have been revolts for th and uprisings for thousands of years. Uh, and the local day-to-day -day economic issues, as you talk about, are very often present in what we call revolution. Certainly the French Revolution uh, would not have arisen, but for issues around bread prices, at least it wouldn't have arisen at that time in that way. So uh, local conditions on the ground and the uh, anger of ordinary folks uh, can be very important and has, as you say, nothing to do with, with ideology. Now, whether the political change is rapid and dramatic or slower, uh, it doesn't have to be a revolution to see the connection between ideology and governance uh, gets attenuated very quickly. Okay. Uh, so, you know, and again, looking at the, at the French Revolution in 1789, there were, again, depending on how you want to slice it, five revolutions in 10 years. And what did they end up with? A Napoleon as an emperor. And 15 years later, they went back to the Bourbon monarchy. So is there ideology there? Is it just a matter of um, how long it takes ideology to permeate throughout the culture. I think uh, I said, and, and you quoted, um, revolutions are very often morally necessary, uh, but historically futile, right? The French Revolution took 90 years to finally get rid of kings and emperors, in part because social changes take a long time. However much we might think there it's not right, um, you can look at, you know, at the French Revolution, you can look at the, the struggle for women to have voting rights, right? 70 years from uh, Seneca Falls conference in the US to the time women in the US were given the right to vote. And 100 years from then until now, and most people on this call would say, we still got a lot of, way, uh, of work to do in terms of the treatment of women. So these things take a long time. Okay, let's move to science. Um, so what, first of all, what would you consider a revolutionary idea today? What would be a revolutionary thing for you? And the second, um, what, uh, what is the relationship between theory and practice? in science, at least in physics. I mean, I've no, I know you cannot talk for biologists, uh, but what's the connection, what's the relation between theory and practice in evolving physics today? All right, let me, so let me try and uh, take a cut at the first question um, about what would count as a revolution. Um, and of course, it's funny, because as, as, uh, as Steve is talking, I'm sort of, I'm constantly thinking about, okay, how is, it, are the science revolutions how do they feel different from the historical revolutions? And one, you know, one interesting aspect is the fact that you know, 
we're many of us um, grew up with uh, with you know Thomas Kuhn's idea of the structure of, of the scientific revolution being so much the way science advances. You know, the idea that um, there's this rear guard that has their ideas, and then you have to um, wait for them basically um, to give in and to or to die to die out before a new idea is is accepted. Um, and now I think I probably thought about that uh, thought of it that way for many years, but I think I've now come to think of it as lots of little mini revolutions and mini breakthroughs that are each of which dramatic. I mean, that you, um, you have a completely different way of, of thinking about some aspect of the world. And they tend not to, uh, in my mind, get fought against as hard as, as Kuhn might have thought. Um, and that people actually are kind of excited about them and they look forward to them um, as, as, as they happen. Um, you know, my own experience of, of the uh, measurement of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe um, was, you know, something of a big shock to everybody. And, and we all thought that, you know, uh, if, and we still think that if we can figure it out, it could actually tell us a whole lot about how physics really works. And yet, um, within a year or so, basically the whole community was on board and excited and, and, and using it. Um, so, so I guess... Um, I'm, you know, when you ask about what counts as a revolution, I'm thinking that there's so many things now that I would think of as being revolutions. I mean, the idea that, oh, I know in my field, the idea that um, our sun is set in a galaxy and that that galaxy is just one of many, many galaxies, that was, you know, shocking when, when it was first, uh, first understood, you know, back in, in, the, in the 30s. Um, and it, it kind of changed our whole picture of where we fit in, in, the, in, this, in the universe. Um, the, uh, of course, you know, the, the parad paradigmatic, you know, dramatic revolutions are things like general relativity and quantum mechanics, where both of them seem to fly in the face of all of our rational picture of how the world, you know, could possibly work. On the other hand, I imagine that, you know, Newtonian mechanics, when it first came along, must have seemed like it was flying in the face of how people thought the world could possibly rationally work. And we've come to accept that as very much, you know, uh, normal. You know, in, in our picture. So, so I think of these things as, in some sense, I think it's kind of interesting to ask this question of, you know, what, to what extent is incrementalism, um, you know, sort of a, 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 a hidden version of uh, revolutionary change. And uh, in fact, I was at some point going to ask uh, both, both, both Steve and Donna um, in their areas, whether they think that the unsung, you know, hidden reforms and incremental changes are perhaps as important or maybe even more important than the ones that we all focus on because they were dramatic and people got killed and you know and and uh, and you know they make great stories and you you know you 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 write the uh, the tale of two cities about a revolutionary moment you don't write it about you know that moment where somebody did a land reform that somehow changed everything and that doesn't make for a good you know Dickensian novel um, so I'm I'm just curious as to whether that whether it, it feels that way in the other in these other areas of, in art as well. Um, that, you know, the, the, those things are as important as these ones that you get headlines. Hey, Donna, you want to take over? Um, <laughs> I guess so. I mean, so much to think about here now. Um, I, I, I guess might as well riff off of this incrementalism um, idea to begin with, because I think, well, there's a couple of different sorts of um, revolutionary aspects to art that I was thinking. I mean, there's revolutionary art as in art that serves a revolution, um, propaganda. <laughs> and, um, and, and then there is art that is revolutionary in some way in that it changes the nature of art um, uh, and, and either creates an art world, a new art world or alters the art world that is there. I mean, the whole notion of an art world is very modern. Um, kind of self-defining and so sets itself up to have these um, so-called revolutions, you know, I mean, these ideological shifts. And, uh, but, but I think it's a kind of a combination of what you've all been describing is what happens. First of all, with regard to what Steve said about um, the ideological aspect, that resonated with me because I have so many students who think of every stylistic change or shift in the history of art as a movement. And to my mind, a movement needs to have some kind of political impetus behind it. Um, you, can have, you can have stylistic um, families and developments, but a movement 
usually has some kind of manifesto along along. So if you can find a manifesto, go ahead, call it a movement. But um, otherwise, right, 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 ask me when you say manifesto, do, do you mean it has to literally be political, or can it just be um, a, a a a change in in theory of some sort that wouldn't have any implications for the what we ordinarily think of as the political world? Uh, <laughs> the the people who are writing it. For whom are writing, I, I, I think they would say that there's a political impetus to it. I mean, some of, when, when, when you're reading it, you might see it as a purely formal thing, but what they're trying to do is, is um, uh, re-entangle art into the social political realm. There's, there's a constant to and you know, back and forth with, with those things. And, and, and now about the incrementalism then, um, I think that there's also something to that where um, over and over what um, what I see is the charisma factor not really entering enough into the equation when we're talking about um, revolutionary artistic moments where somebody who's much lesser known, some friend of a friend of the artist that we now all look at, Picasso, for example, um, you know, Everybody but talks about Picasso, uh, but but we don't talk nearly as much about Brock Hungry and all of the other artists who were working in that vein and working towards um, a kind of you know you, cubism. Or you know then we back up to to Cezanne, and so everybody's always looking at what everyone else is doing. And uh, when you read into these histories more deeply, you find out that an awful lot of the times what's um, looked at as a revolutionary development in the history of art um, comes from somebody visiting somebody else's studio and stealing an idea. Um, but the person who stole the idea is very uh, charismatic or uh, you know, very politically minded, maybe pulls everybody together, writes a manifesto, and then voila, we've, you know, we've turned it into a revolution as opposed to an evolution. So <clears throat> I think, yeah, the, the Revolution is a kind of handy term when we're teaching intro art history, <laughs> but uh, but but the the more finely grained histories, um, it becomes less and less revolutionary in a sense. Now, I, I mean, there are exceptions um, to that sort of thing. I think I mean, and, and I thought of one. I'm going because, of course, I'm an art historian. I had to have um, uh, images. I don't know if I can, yeah. So of course this is the classic revolutionary image, right? But it's propaganda. It's um, Jacques-Louis David's um, painting in service of the, the French Revolution. Um, uh, and then here's another revolutionary image, um, which I think to our eyes doesn't look particularly revolutionary because it's so um, um, naturalistic, um, but um, it's, it's revolutionary in, in the sense that it's also a kind of propaganda, but for the scientific revolution. Um, but in addition to that, because of its empiricism, which is not something that um, you, you were seeing um, prior to this, I mean, it's very dramatic empiricism, um, but it rhymes, right, with the kind of revolution that it's um, pictorializing. Um, <laughs> moving, skipping, you know, this is another one of these, so, so art in the service of a political, or, or, you know, of a revolutionary moment, is the art revolutionary? Well, yes, because of the way that it belongs to that revolutionary moment. Of course, I had to include this one right now because, <laughs> Um, it, it, this, this, first of all, the period that I study most closely is the 1960s and 70s, but also, I mean, uh, we, we could have a whole long conversation about the liberation of Aunt Jemima just because of all of the elements that, um, that, that resonate right now with the Black Power, Power Fist. I mean, the fact that Aunt Jemima just got retired, I think, last month um, by, by the, uh, the company that ma manufactured the, um, uh, the, the syrup. Um, <clears throat> but it, this is, it, it's not propaganda in this case. You know, it's, it's bringing the revolution into the art and 
uh, and vice versa. And I wanted to also bring Betty Saar in because um, of this phrase that has stuck with me for years and years and years and still um, always thinking about with, with the period that I study where artists would say, well, that idea was in the air. And when I was a grad student, I thought, what a ridiculous dodge, you know? <laughs> An idea isn't just in the air. You got that from somewhere. What, you know, I, I need to find out where that comes from. Um, and now I'm starting to believe that sometimes ideas are in the air, <laughs> um, that, that they're, ju they're just, they, they reach this kind of critical mass where the very fact that we don't know where it's coming from indicates maybe we're in a revolutionary moment, if not a revolution. Um, that's, that's my theory. Um, <clears throat> Scientific revolution again, uh, you know, coupled with formal revolutions. So Kandinsky is a formal revolution where he's moving to purely abstract art. Of course, he's just one of the most famous of um, artists who are doing this sort of thing. But at the same time, he's um, hearing about um, general relativity and it's shifting his notion of what reality is. Um, and so there is this um, uh, connection between two different kinds of, of revolutionary thinking. It can be a complete, this is a great thing about art, it can be complete misunderstanding of the scientific revolution that's inspiring, and yet it becomes a revolutionary shift in the art itself. Here we have a quintessentially revolutionary <clears throat> work of art where, you know, the, and, and, but in a, in a sense, it's not the object that's revolutionary. I mean, we can't see in the object itself what makes this so revolutionary. Um, instead, what makes it revolutionary, of course, is the posture of Marcel Duchamp and his statement, his declaration um, that this is art. Um, but of course, it wouldn't work. And that gets back to what Steve says. It depends on who you ask and when and all of these other kinds of things. It wouldn't have worked if he didn't have a whole lot of other people willing to go along with this idea. Um, and then um, I just have this here, again, getting back to the period that I write about the most. Um, in the 1960s, you have critics like Jack Burnham um, also reading Thomas Kuhn and um, thinking about scientific revolutions and about technology as well. Um, this is a time when cybernetics is moving into artistic circles um, and um, the, whole, the whole scene kind of explodes. And this, this, the notion that uh, art would be a kind of pure medium like paint or bronze um, is just no longer relevant instead um, the emphasis is on systems and experience and um, and art no longer has a kind of fixed value. Um, it, it's instead this kind of social thing. What, what, what's kind of interesting is that we have fundamentalism, of course, continuing to exist side by side with that. And um, it's, it's the area of sculpture that expands, ex well, um, in a way that we have yet to really fully um, measure while painting remains pure. So uh, I, I just find that as a kind of interesting comparison where in a way revolution always requires, of course, the stasis. Um, you know, whatever fundamentalist you're, you're um, uh, working against, um, they need to be there in order to have a kind of uh, a revolutionary moment, at least in art. So <clears throat> there's my slideshow. <laughs> um, I have a question. <clears throat> um, so given that uh, there's incremental progress all the time, but a century ago, we, we, we lived the age of the ism, right? Uh, cubism, Surrealism, Expressionism, Futurism, for probably missing some. Mm -hmm. Now we don't hear that, that so much. Um, is it just because we ran out of vocabulary or is it because uh, there used to be more enthusiasm and more critical mass around the new idea somehow? 
Uh, well, they, they, it's complicated. <laughs> uh, I, I'd say number one, you need um, his, you, 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 you need historical distance. Um, so a lot of those isms are retroactively assigned to the work. Cubism was not, and um, there was definitely this. I mean, those guys um, were quite politically minded. I mean, they had this kind of uh, new Marxist world order in their heads that they were um, subscribing to. And so um, they were keen to call it an ism, as were the futurists. They, I mean, the futurists were very much um, committed to a revolution uh, in, the, in, in the purest form, as, as um, Steve described. I mean, they, they were um, proponents of a revolutionary, uh, 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 of a violent overthrow of the status quo. Um, but a, a lot of those other isms, like expressionism, that's, that's a retroactively applied label. And so in a way, I think the things like cubism and futurism, may, maybe the artists who, who came up with that in a way um, started training us to see things um, as isms or um, in, in, in that way. Um, and, and that gets back to this question, like I say, you know, where as, as soon as we put ism on something, it gets called a movement. Um, but so for example, minimalism in the States, um, you, you call it minimalism. Well, there's nothing really, you know, if, if, if ism means ideology, um, then you should never be calling this minimalist art because these guys in no way, shape or form um, constituted a movement. <laughs> I mean, they were not looking to work together. They were, they were um, adamant individualists. And so uh, I think we have to be careful about, um, and we've talked about this before, the, the semantics um, that we're, we're as historians, we were able to create a revolution where maybe one didn't exist. <laughs> okay, that, that brings me to the next question. Uh, what is the role of galleries, museums, critics in, uh, in, uh, in creating this, uh, you know, this jump in, uh, in, uh, in what is uh, fashionable in art, what is influential in art? Oh, enormous, enormous. A lot of those names um, well, cubism, for example, I mean, they came up with the, the cubists themselves came up with it, but I would say that, well, certainly in this country, um, the Museum of Modern Art and Alfred Barr, who was the, the curator, he had this blockbuster exhibition uh, on cubism and, um, um, and, and what these exhibitions do is they gather everything up together and they put them under one, under one label. Um, and so it becomes something that we can, um, comprehend in both a, a literal and figurative um, way. And if, if you, when you're reading the history, it's always marked by these exhibitions that um, the people went to see and had this transformative moment. So yeah, when, when Picasso first, um, his work first showed up in New York, um, this is revelatory to um, artists who are working there and you know there's a there's a before and after of when um, Picasso and Matisse's art for example shows up in New York and then of course all of the young soon-to-be abstract expressionists <laughs> um, uh, are all looking at it again ab abstract expressionism that that was applied to to their work i mean they were also called action painters and i think that's probably a little bit more accurate for a few of them and, and of course the one difference between art uh, politics and science is is money right once uh, you have a revolution and you have a new movement there's money attached to it you know so the painting can suddenly be worth a hundred million dollars well, yes and no. I mean, I, I have, I'm, I'm very, very sorry after um, Steve mentioned the Russian Revolution, I thought, how on earth could I not have put a slide in here of the, um, of the constructivists? But I mean, there's your biggest, this is the purest revolutionary um, would be somebody like Malevich in, in um, um, after the Russian Revolution, where they, they were truly committed to 
um, developing a revolutionary kind of abstract art that met the moment. So um, it, it was art that was meant to be revolutionary in both senses, so formally revolutionary and politically revolutionary at the same time. And there's no way, considering the circumstances, that these guys were ever going to see any money from what they were doing. I mean, that was the furthest thing from, um, from their minds, and none of them did make any money. I mean, um, Stalin forced uh, a lot of them to stop making this um, either, either um, absolutely or uh, through pressure and they got to live through it and, and make different kinds of work. Of course that work um, gets sold for huge amounts of some money to uh, Western collectors, but I would say that's got nothing to do with um, what makes it revolutionary or um, you know, what, the, what the artists were, what the artists were doing. Question for both Donna and Saul. <clears throat> uh, before I tell you the question, let me tell you why I'm asking the question. Um, uh, believe it or not, I'm an expert in, in uh, popular music, or better, what I ask, what I call unpopular music. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, revolutions in, uh, in uh, popular music very often are driven by a new instrument. You know, the electric guitar, the synthesizer, the drum machine, the sampler. Each of these things, actually, there's a, sometimes there's a specific model, specific, in one case, a Roland uh, device uh, that went, uh, was discontinued and it was very cheap to buy on the street and that started a whole new movement in, a, in a electronic dance. So the, the, the tool, okay, the tool is very important actually in music, it has an impact. Now, what about art? And uh, physics is the tool important. I mean, uh, uh, when when you when you get a new uh, tool to do research or to uh, express uh, uh, visually, um, does that trigger a new movement? Should I go first. Uh, I mean, I say absolutely. Right. Uh, that my sense in in the sciences is that often um, you. Know, you, you're leapfrogging the the uh, capabilities um, of the you know, the theory, the experiment, and then the instrumentation, um, and then the instrumentation is often triggering a whole new set of uh, discoveries, and then that's you know giving you another whole round of theories, and then another round of uh, experiments. Um, so it, it, in, in science, it, it seems very clear that you're that it, it shows up all over the place. Yeah, uh, same in art. Um... And I think it's a similar thing where you have uh, something. So, for example, um, acrylic art or, or acrylic paint when it was developed that changes the way that you can paint because you can you dilute it with water, it dries really quickly, and that that quick drying means there's different things that you can do with it. For example, I mean, I, I, but I don't think that that was that, that latex paint was first of all developed so that artists could fiddle around with it and do that kind of thing. They saw this new material and decided to play around with it, household versions or, or you know, they got a hold of commercial versions of this. Um, and then it became commercialized and um, standardized and something that everybody could use. And this happens over and over and over again where um, the tool definitely changes everything, but what you first need is an artistic mindset that allows you to recognize the potential for something to be a tool um, for, for what you do, um, or potential to, having the potential to change the way you do what you do. Um, and then after it's utilized, it gets recognized as an artistic tool. So you've got I, to- actually, I have a question to ask you about that. The, I mean, I think in the sciences, often these tools are being invented by the scientists because they know what they're trying to make uh, to, to be able to see and they can't see it, but they know that if they can invent this tool, they can do it. I think in music that's happened also, right? Where um, it, mu musicians have, have wanted to get a certain kind of sound or, or something and they've gone out and they've tried to play with, with uh, new instruments and new electronics. I mean, is, that, is that right as, as well, Hero? Uh, not quite. I mean, most instruments were invented by big corporations that had access oh, that's to new technology. And, yeah. uh, and sometimes musicians were surprised by it. But in a sense, yes, because the, the musicians selected what was out there. So, And, and I don't know about in the, in the, in the, uh, in the arts, um, you know, I assume that the artists sometimes are 
trying to push the technologies as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, some of the artists that I've written about, they uh, experimented in the late 60s, early 70s with um, uh, poly resins and um, often with quite dangerous effects. But, um, but there, for example, there's an artist named Dwayne Valentine who worked very, very closely with a resin manufacturer and, um, and, and they created a couple of, um, of, of specific types um, um, for him, for and with him. So there were um, certain kinds of pigmented resins that he had um, a direct hand in, in developing, yeah. And, and uh, I think some of uh, uh, today's artists are inventors. You know, I have friends, some of them have been laser speakers uh, who use software and hardware to invent the platform for their art. At particular, now in artificial intelligence, in, a, um, in a bio art, uh, you, see, uh, you see artists who are really pushing the envelope in those, uh, in those fields. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, photography uh, is a good example of uh, being an invention that then, you know, that there was also art. So, um, <clears throat> okay, there's a good question that I, I was uh, waiting for the right moment to ask from uh, Michael G. And this is starting with Steve, but then uh, for all you guys, are there metrics, conditions, or parameters which can be indicators that a revolution is imminent. And again, we are now using revolution in a very you know, vague uh, way. There's, there's something important is about to happen. Are there metrics that can tell us something is about to happen in our field? Um, well, I, I'm inclined to start with a quote from Winston Churchill who said, I never prophesy, especially about the future. <laughs> Um, which is to say that, uh, one, historians are, can be very bad futurists, uh, but two, uh, the nature of political revolution is that it's sufficiently fast moving that there's no good way to sort of see things in the moment. So the indicators, the, the leading indicators that Michael is looking for are really only visible in the in the rear view mirror. Uh, after the event, we can say, "Oh, this might have been caused by you know what whatever." I mean, the take the French Revolution and and the the debt load of the French monarchy. Was it a problem? Was it a contributor to the revolution? Yes. Did people know about it at the time? Yes. If you asked them, was there going to be a revolution in the next five years? people would have thought you're crazy. Um, so uh, a long way of saying there's no good predictive theory of revolution that I know of. Um, and most of the, re uh, the retrospective theories of revolution are kind of dodgy as well. So Donna? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to predict, although, well, I, I can say that, um, that, that uh, there is a certain amount of deja vu that um, I was encountering this summer as somebody who uh, spent a lot of time, um, who spent a lot of time reading about American history of the late 1960s? That um, I, I, I think that 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 those ideas were again um, back back in the air. Well, or in in, in the fore um, uh, anyway, and um, um, probably just by accident, I predicted um, the Black Lives Matter. <laughs> um, um, uh, protest to a couple of friends just because you could see um, so many of the elements um, that were that were similar but of course you know we can we can only say that was um, that was clever in retrospect <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say in the sciences uh, there's a few things that um, are often leading indicators I mean one is um, as technologies open up a whole new, um, uh, let's say, uh, accuracy of measurement. Um, 
and you get a, a you know, lot of new data in a field that's relatively young, that is often a, a time in which you'll have a chance at getting some uh, revolutionary ideas um, out of it. And then the other one is um, when you're in fields where you're aware of things that don't fit and that we have you know, three or four or five um, parts of the, of the story that just don't work well together, that are crying out for some you know, combined explanation for why, why they all don't fit. Um, th those are both indicators, but they, of course, they don't tell you when that revolution will happen. Um, you know, my own field right now, we've been, uh, you know, we, we assumed that you know, once we saw the acceleration of the universe, that it would just be a matter of uh, you know, a little while before we would um, have some new aha moment and we understand what was going on. Uh, right now, we're waiting for this whole new um, generation of, of high quality data um, that might allow us to see it, but there's no, there's no guarantee. You know, it could be that we'll take another generation uh, or more you know, till, till we suddenly see the aha of what, of what has to solve the current problems. We have a question for both Donna and uh, Saul, and it has to do with, uh, uh, with the, the transmission of ideas uh, across space and time. Now, in, in, uh, in Newton's time, in Galileo's time, in, uh, it was relatively easy to know what's going on. Um, now, thousands of papers are published every year, right? <clears throat> I don't know how many in physics. I just saw the number for a, a, a little branch of medicine was 70,000. Um, anyway, thousands of papers. How does the scientific community uh, decide that there's a new idea around? How, how does this happen? And then Donna, you, I have the same question for you. There are thousands of artists out there, thousands of galleries, uh, every day exhibiting somewhere in the world, we're now with constraints. How does the art community decide, ends up agreeing that there's a new movement, that there's a new big thing that we have to follow? Saul, you want to go first? You know, so my impression is that in the sciences, and let me begin with sort of the, the normal sciences in the sense that, uh, you know, papers that are written by recognized other scientists at other academic institutions, um, and I'll come back in a second to the, the complete outsiders, but in ordinary science and ordinary papers that are being written, um, there's, I think what's going on is that everybody is combing the literature and trying to bring to the fore um, papers that they feel are perhaps addressing something that's, um, that's one of these key problems. Uh, and I think people have come to kind of recognize where it is that we're stuck and they're looking for something that would you know, free up those, those particular problems. So if a paper comes out, which seems like it could actually do that, um, there's a lot of people who will all bring it to your attention. Um, there's hundreds of papers that you actually never get a chance to even hear about, let alone read. Um, and, and you're counting on the fact that there's so many people reading all these, uh, you know, following all these different literatures that somebody will, will, will bring it to the weekly journal club if it looks like it's addressing something that everybody cares about. Um, so that's, I guess, one of the reasons why there are these, organiza these you know, organizational activities like journal clubs in the, in the sciences, uh, because nobody can keep track of all but themselves, and they're counting on each other to be scanning through the titles and the abstracts and trying to find the ones that look like they may address something that we all care about. I will say, though, that, you know, as, as I was starting to say before, um, if something is really, really wonderful, and yet it doesn't come in speaking any of the languages that we're all using, I think it could easily just pass us by. Um, and, uh, and it's one of the reasons why in my, uh, you know, every day in my, in my mail, my email, I'm getting these, um, these uh, theories from random people uh, telling me that they've figured out what was wrong with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, you know, here's their explanation. But the problem is that, first of all, they're coming every day. And any one article, of course, could take you months to figure out, you know, what, what they mean. And then when they're not coming in using any of the language of the, of the common vocabulary, um, it's it really becomes impossible to tell whether there's actually an interesting idea there, especially since so many of them, when you first look at them, you realize that actually the person just misunderstood what the problem was. And, they, uh, and they just, they're just not speaking enough of the language to be able to address the, the, the current problems. Um, but I always have this you know, sort of uh, secret desire to set up a website where you would collect um, you know, all of the best crazy ideas that are out there and have um, all of the people who are writing them review each other's and then 
um, collect them to the point where at the end of every year, they would put forward one that the, um, that the academic scientists would really try hard to read and see whether uh, there, there's, there's something going, going on in them. I, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to build that yet, but, I, but one of these days I'd love to try. I, th I think it's called the uh, make me lucky button in Google. <laughs> Uh, well, it's a very different thing in the in the art world. Um, well, and, and I keep saying the art world, but there really isn't just one art world, which is a problem. Um, so, uh, first of all, it's it, this is not really a, an academic endeavor finding out what you know art is um, changing this scene. An awful lot of academics are involved in it. I mean, you know, most artists I know it seems are teaching in some way or other or affiliated with an institution and certainly art historians are, um, but commercial galleries um, are, are a different, um, are, are a different animal. And Piero, you mentioned before money. I mean, with the contemporary art scene, that's a real issue, a real question. So the, the, the most important new art is not necessarily the art that billionaires are paying huge sums for in order to keep their money offshore. And <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm a lot of this work is, is just purchased and then disappeared because it's, it's basically an investment tool. There's a very big difference between something being fashionable and something being revolutionary. And I think we can identify what's fashionable really easily. Um, but something that's revolutionary, I mean, uh, what Saul was saying reminded me of what Freeman Dyson also said that, you know, we're, we're all chasing the fashionable. I mean, right now, how many opportunities aren't there to pursue something that has something to do with COVID-19? Um, two years from now, we are going to be so tired of reading all of these things about pandemics and so tired of pandemics. And I hope <laughs> we'll be, I hope we'll be really tired of pandemics uh, two years from now. It's, it's you know, uh, appallingly, um, while we're still in it, already a fashionable, fashionable topic in, I mean, in the arts as, as well as um, in our conversations. Um, but revolutionary is something that uh, you know, maybe one or two people are going to to recognize, but it th that that doesn't necessarily um, emerge right away, or even worse yet. When I'm going to, I mean, there's so much art being made around the world all of the time. Um, I you know that I can pretty confidently say that there is something really brilliant being made right now that nobody's ever going to know about. Um, or at least not going to know about for a long, long time. I mean, in, in my field, you know, I have medievalist art historians who are still bringing stuff forward and saying, look at this. I mean, that's a thousand years old. So um, the, the time factor um, and, and that the distance that, that time brings um, seems to be really important for our ability to recognize what a revolution is. Mm -hmm. So, is, is money a problem or a factor? Is it a factor in science? I mean, you guys cost a lot of money. <laughs> I'm trying to think. It's, I mean, obviously, it, there's the questions of distorting what you would hope would really happen, is, is I think what you're trying to ask about. Um, and I guess one uh, possible way things get distorted is if uh, people are chasing, you know, um, some technology uh, that they think they can you know, make, might make money off of, you know, build, build some widget when in fact it doesn't really move science forward. Another way is if people are, are hunting for um, funding and they find that they can convince some, you know, uh, congressman um, to, to make something happen, uh, even though it's not actually the top priority, um, you know, for most of the sciences. But my sense is that I don't feel like that's the obvious problem. Um, you know, in, in ours in the same way that you're describing for, for, for art, um, just because perhaps it's, it's probably because there's so many different um, ways in that you would like people to start science projects that um, if, as long as there was some room for some resources to get different things started, um, I, I would be less worried about the different motivations for them. Maybe profit is perfectly fine for certain you know, cases, in um, to try to drive something new, um, as long as there's also other um, ways to to start projects, you know, with just because you're curiosity driven. 
and um, and there are waves of, of success in that. I'd say right now we're in, a, in maybe a, a time that's a little bit overly um, applied in its in its goals. Um, but it's it's it feels like it's a little different from the, the uh, from this problem that you're describing in the sciences. Okay, I have, arts, one, mm -hmm. I have a one final question, which is actually <clears throat> uh, one of the, the most interesting questions for me. Um, I know it's a difficult one, and I know the books have been written about this. And I just wonder if you if you have opinions. Uh, do do politics, science, and art cross pollinate revolutions? And of course, their favorite examples, uh, Athens, uh, Florence, Paris at the turn of the, uh, the century, the last century. And uh, if you believe my book on Silicon Valley, even the Bay Area that had um, all these crazy si um, artists and, uh, and writers and so on, and at the same time uh, spawned uh, Silicon Valley. So what's your opinion? And do politics, the political situation, the political ideas, the artistic idea and the scientific idea cross pollinate revolutions. I'll start. Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't think there's so. I mean, I, I, there was a, a desperate urge or tr um, effort made uh, in the 20th century to create something called pure art. Um, I think they failed because, frankly, that was. Um, that, that had to be a social political enterprise. I mean, they were trying to protect art from um, becoming propaganda, but in so doing, you link it to, to politics. So um, I, I would say, uh, well, in, in the examples that I gave, I mean, these things are, are um, inextricably linked. Steve, Sol, any opinion? Well, I mean, I think you can point to lots of uh, connections between art and, and politics. So Donna did a, uh, a couple of those. The David painting uh, is one. The Kadinsky, um, you know, it is another. Um, you know, whether art or science per se stimulate political revolution. Oh, that's uh, another I, question. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not so sure. I'm no. not so sure. Wait, would you think there's any, uh, was there any sense in which the sort of rationalist enlightenment, um, you know, grew out of a Newtonian picture of the world or was, is that oversold? Uh, well, I think it, I think it's a bit oversold. Um, you know, the number of people who read and understood Newton in the 18th century, even after it was translated into French, by you know Voltaire's girlfriend, you know, still pretty small. Yeah. Um, so, you know, did he put? Did Newton eventually, you know, come out with his uh, Principia and, as Donna said, put that in the air? Um, yeah, but hard to find the direct connections. And when you, and when you you know people often talk about the uh, you know the sort of the American Constitution writers. Uh, being, you know, very much, uh, you know, influenced by this this concept of uh, this checks and balances being built on a rationalist, you know, slightly scientific uh, Benjamin Franklin belief. Is is that also a propaganda? You know, in the end, because I know that there's been a lot of sort of science boosterism that came in the game as well. Um, yeah, I, after the fact, you know, I I think that's a a bit of post hoc rationalization. So okay, that's why I was, that's why I was betting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. Ideas of balanced and mixed government were around, you know, for a long time. Whether they got any traction is a is a is a different matter. So, um, yeah, I, I'm 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 not so sure. Yeah. Okay. Good. We passed the hour, so I think it's a good time to end. To be continued. To be continued. Um, Okay, so thank you audience for joining us for this term, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you uh, panelists. Uh, on Wednesday, we will hear from uh, Julie Parsonet, uh, Stanford epidemiologist on COVID-19. As Donna said, we hope that in a couple of years, we will not be talking about pandemics anymore. And for the rest of my life, hopefully. And on Thursday, we will hear from a group of young uh, visionary artists and inventors uh, who are changing the way art is exhibited 
and consumed. Check out lasertalks.com for the program. Okay, thank you very much, Donna, Steve, and uh, Saul. I